Um, you're all very welcome now. Um, I'll be going through this. Uh, the first part of it, I think, is relatively straightforward material anyway. And um, I'll be covering the background and the context to the building control regulations, saying something about the building regulations, etc., and trying to put that into context. Then I'll be talking a little bit about the stakeholder uh, consultation process, uh, which a number of us were involved in. Um, the Building Control Authority, where they fit in and where they continue to fit in within this. <coughs> and then some issues in relation to uh, issues that, you know, uh, from my perspective, that I'd like to maybe raise here tonight. Um, we'll also be covering the uh, regulations, which is the 2013 amended uh, Building Control uh, regulations. Um, John O'Connor then will speak about the certificates and the Code of Practice. And as Anthony has said, John chairs the Code of Practice working uh, group, so John is very well placed to do that. Now, just to say what's not covered within this, because very often there's confusion uh, in relation to building regulations and building control regulations. First thing is that um, we won't be covering in any detail the building control regulations uh, prior to 2013, uh, they are standalone in itself. We will, will be I will be referencing them as I'm going through the introduction, but we won't be doing anything in any detail on the likes of the disability certs, the seven day notices, or anything like that. Uh, the seven day notices will be amended, uh, at least the, the commencement notices and seven day notices, uh, you know, there are implications for that. Uh, the Building Control Regulations Part A to M are standalone, again, in their own right, so we won't be covering that. And the legacy issues, you know, what went wrong or what didn't go wrong in, in more recent time, uh, I think we leave a lot of that to, to history there. And insurances is something that did come up within the Code of Practice Working Group, but by the same token, uh, it's something that the, the department and the minister, in his wisdom, decided would not be part of the code of practice as such. But I will be talking just briefly about insurances. <coughs> so, excuse me. <coughs> just for background and context, the building control system in Ireland, it comes under the Building Control Act of Acts of 1990 uh, and 207. And um, the acts allow the introduction of building regulations and they provide the underpinning legal foundation for the system of enforcement. <clears throat> the Building Control Act of 1990 was enabling legislation for building regulations and building control regulations. The building regulations, uh, as you all know, embrace broad functional requirements or their general statements of intent of the relevant regulation. <clears throat> now, I think we all know that building regulations uh, and the building control, the purpose of the Act uh, basically is safety, health, and welfare of persons in and around buildings, uh, universal access, um, and that this would be the, the needs of people with uh, reduced mobilities, etc. But for visitors and persons, it used to be disabled people, but now it is, it's more broad based and it's in the context of universal access, conservation of fuel and energy, which is part L of the building regulations. Uh, good building practice and efficient use of resources. <coughs> so under section 3.5 3 of the Building Control Act of 1990, it says buildings must be designed and constructed in accordance with the building regulations. Um, that's been there from the very start and that hasn't changed. And these are minimum standards. And just to go back a little bit in relation to the uh, chronology uh, going back to 1880, Dublin Corporation uh, had bylaws, and bylaws, as I think you all know, uh, were very prescriptive. Um, there were only seven local authorities, including Dublin and Cork, who had bylaws. And by and large, uh, there was no building bylaws in any of the other uh, counties. Um, and in effect, the building uh, control system was picked up um, by proxy uh, as part of the planning process during that time. You had the 81 proposed building regulations, you had an 84 draft, or sorry, building control bill, 
you had a draft building control regulations and technical documents. Uh, you had in 1990, this is the start of the building control system as we know it. Uh, so the Act came out in 90. Building regulations were introduced in 1991, uh, and the, so too were the building control uh, regulations, and they commenced in June of 92. And then in 1997, the building uh, regulations were revised and consolidated. So. Um, what went before was brought forward within that. Now, unlike the UK, we never had a building, uh, a local authority building regulations approval system. Uh, the local authorities, insofar as fire safety certs uh, were um, quasi, I would say, approval system, insofar as if you, if you constructed in accordance with the approval, you de facto complied. So, um, and that still continues. So, as I say, unlike the UK, where, they, where the local authorities had uh, plans approval and uh, building regulations approval, and in the UK they also have uh, private sector people, uh, a limited number of, of designated bodies that uh, could do the same thing. So the Building Control Act of 90 and 207, as I've said, is enabling legislation for regulations for both building and building control regulations. And it sets out the responsibilities for design and construction. It sets out the powers of inspection and enforcement of building control authorities. And then other matters which came in in 2007 uh, include the registration of architects and building surveyors. Now I'll be talking about uh, chartered engineers as well uh, when we come to it. <clears throat> the building control regulations then made provision for procedural, administrative and control aspects. So if you think of building control as procedural, the building regulations, uh, they deal with the technical or functional requirements, but they're written in general performance terms. And then the technical guidance documents uh, are guidance, but prima facie. So if you comply with those, you're, compl you're deemed to be uh, complying with the building regulations. Now the Building Control uh, Acts allow the Minister in the 1990 Act under Section two, uh, 6 uh, to provide for the submission of building control authorities of certificates and they were referred to in the 90 Act as certificates of compliance. So there was provision for it, it's just taken, uh, what, 23 years to uh, actually implement that section of the regulations. Now just going to the stakeholder engagement process, um, the Department of the Environment uh, sent out a draft document called Strengthening the uh, Building Control System. Now they would have consulted with the professional institutes and that would have included Engineers Ireland, ACEI, RIA, I and others. Uh, and also, uh, you know, it, it, internally, uh, within the department, uh, they would have also, um, you know, had their, their consultation. Um, there were 504 submissions received, and uh, I, the one the, there was consensus on a desire for change. Not everybody agreed with what the change should be. Some people saw a greater role of local authorities, and others perhaps saw it as entirely self-certification. Um, the stakeholder consultation process followed and we had uh, two groups set up. One was the stakeholder uh, consultation group and the other was the code of practice which followed the stakeholder consultation group. Stakeholders basically all agreed that in order to, to bring this very significant change that a code of practice uh, would be a minimum that, that uh, you know, people could live with. And uh, that's where, under John O'Connor's chairmanship, the Code of Practice Working Group was formed. Now, further engagement then uh, will take place and is ongoing with professional bodies and the construction industry in relation to communication, in relation to where do we go from here. So it's by no means uh, cast in stone. There's a lot of work to be done uh, in relation to further guidance and, and so forth. Um, this always reminds me of the stages of a project, and I think it follows uh, many projects I've been involved in myself, 
but it starts with uh, during the consultation process and even before it, wild enthusiasm for change, disillusionment when the uh, draft document came out because people could see lots of downsides in relation to uh, liability, professional indemnity insurance, and uh, the workability of the system and even the wording that was initially proposed. So the, uh, the utter panic, I think, did follow. And as usual, we get the search for the guilty, people blaming each other. And uh, there is a blame culture, I think, in this country when, it, when things are perceived to go wrong. Now, things haven't gone that far wrong, but in certain areas, uh, certainly in the uh, dwelling side of things, there has been with the, you know, the high profile uh, um, incidents there with fire safety, service, pie rights, etc. There's been a lot of media attention and unwelcome media t attention, I think, from the perspective of the industry. Punishment of the innocent, uh, that remains to be seen. And then the last stage of a project, as they say, is praise for the non-participants. Uh, politicians are now lining up to say, this is the panacea, and this will sort it. I think that remains to be seen. Now, in relation to working within the code of practice, um, I think it's fair to say that most people came at it <coughs> maybe from their own institute's perspective to begin with, and the intention was to mitigate and moderate the negative effect on contractors had one perspective, the professionals had another perspective. And uh, we had a very tight uh, time schedule in which to get uh, the code of practice agreed. <clears throat> there was a little bit, not unlike the Croke Park agreement, of the sword of Damocles hanging over the heads. I don't know whether John will agree with this or not, but uh, many people went into the meeting feeling, well, okay, we have what the department uh, more or less said to us, well, look, uh, you have a couple of months to agree. If you don't agree, we'll publish what we have. Uh, now, I, that's me paraphrasing, but that's pretty much uh, the way it was. Now, on the positive side, I think that focused minds and, uh, you know, the usual ritual sniffing and people sort of uh, settling in uh, was perhaps much quicker. And then uh, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, most people uh, present within the code of practice had a public interest as well as their own individual uh, perspectives. And good progress was made. Um, it may not, won't be everybody's cup of tea, but uh, compared to what the original proposals were, I think a lot of progress was actually made. So, um, and we were there to try to influence it there. Now, the thing about the building control amendments is it's not a panacea. There is no magic wand. Um, it, it, it will, it, in my opinion anyway, it will certainly move things in the right direction. Uh, but it's organic and it's a process that, uh, you know, need, needs to be, uh, people need to buy into that. Now, I, I'll go uh, into that later. And uh, <clears throat> a favourite of mine is Voltaire, who says, the best is the enemy of the good. So I think in the with, given the resources we have and given the options that we have, um, you know, what... <laughs> we have made progress and it, my own personal view is that anything is an improvement on, on uh, what went uh, by before. So the devil is very much in the detail. Now the Building Control Act introduced the a provision for registration of architects, building surveyors and quantity surveyors. Now I was involved in the original uh, forum for the construction industry process. Engineers Ireland were part of that process. Uh, builders were also uh, part of the process, and it was seen that all bodies would be registered. Um, Engineers Ireland felt uh, we have the, the charter, and that's sufficient for us, and ducked out. Uh, the builders, I think, between the, or, you know, there, there would have been maybe different views uh, uh, within the, uh, the Construction Industry Federation, but they decided that registration of builders was not needed at the time. So what went forward was registration of architects and building surveyors. Now, quantity surveyors were also registered, but in the context of the building control amendment regulations, uh, it's, they're not an issue. Now, I said earlier that Section 2.2 uh, allowed the minister to provide for certificates, so that's already been covered. Now, 
categories of primary persons. The reason I'm calling it primary persons authorised to sign certificates is there are ancillary certificates provided for within the building control uh, regulations. So the people that are, are the, the categories that are mentioned in the Act are architects on the register. So that would be the RIAI on behalf of the state are the registration body for architects. There will be architects who are not necessarily members of the RIAI, but they are, if they're a registered architect, they may sign, uh, or they, 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 they will be the primary people involved uh, as assigned certifiers. Building surveyors then on the register, again, the same act, and chartered engineers pursuant to section seven of the Institution of Civil Engineers of Ireland, and that is the act that, that brought the charter uh, here. Um, I think it's fair to say too that by chartered engineers, uh, competence is very much a factor. So um, the primary groups there that will be certified will be structural and civil engineers. There may be others who over the years or depending on the complexity or non-complexity of the work that's being done uh, may also come within that. But we see it as being primarily in that area. So the regulations specifically require the certifier to be competent to inspect and certify the, the, the works. And I'll talk a little more about competence. Now, under the um, state registration for building surveyors, and the reason I've just put that up, I'm on the state registration board for building surveyors. But under, you have the registration advisory committee, you have the building surveyors uh, registered there, you have an admissions board here, and they process the applications, and then you have a technical assessment board. It's very similar for the architects, they have the same model. Now, if you go over here on professional conduct, and I think this is a critical factor in the Building Control Amendment regulations, any person can complain about professional conduct, uh, or professional misconduct in, that, in that, this particular uh, case. So, um, the other thing is, we would also see uh, the, the, the various professional institutes having a role and maybe a first port of call in the event of errant certifiers or negligent individuals. So, and uh, you know, obviously the rule of law will have to uh, apply in relation to you know, problem areas and that will work itself through the system. Now, on the professional conduct board under part six, fitness to practice, it requires the registration body to prepare a code and that has been set out in relation to the architects and the building surveyors and Engineers Ireland has its own uh, code of ethics and conduct. So that the, these will be key aspects. And from my own experience over the years within construction, competence is one factor, but uh, ethical uh, conduct, I think, very often can be uh, more important. Um, I was involved in another life there uh, in, you know, in, in uh, the likes of site suitability assessments for on-site wastewater treatment systems, your septic tanks, etc. And very often some of the people that you know, came forward for uh, professional competence assessment uh, m might have been well able to do the work but didn't always do it in the way that they knew it should be done. So expediency is a problem here. So the professional conduct uh, will, will be downstream a big issue in relation to people who uh, don't take the system seriously. So, the, uh, so the, the complaints made to the Professional conduct, conduct Committee, they decide either no case to answer, mediation or inquiry. Now this is coming to the Institution of Engineers, uh, the, the Charter Amendment Act, and there is a code of ethics and bylaws and that is going to be a, a, a critical part. And I think working within your competence, or working within an individual's competence, doesn't matter what your background is, whether you're civil, structural, or, or otherwise, you know, to be offering services, you need to be working within your own area of uh, uh, professional uh, capacity there. So um, the code of practice is guided by the codes of conduct by the appropriate registered professional bodies, and they should be made publicly available. Now the building control, building control authority here 
I think you're all familiar with the uh, building control regulations. You have commencement notices, fire safety certs, disability access certs, uh, seven day notices. So all of those are, were in the system before now. What's new is design certificates, <coughs> notice of assignment by the owner of the assigned certifier and builder, certificates of undertaking uh, by the assigned certifier and, building, uh, and builder, completion certs, inspection plans, and then a public register of notices and certificates. And then all of those are informed by the code of practice. If you go to the far side here, you, excuse me, you have the building regulations, which uh, you know, are coexisting here, and then the technical guidance documents and other standards which inform the building regulations. Now, the responsibility of the Building Control Authority is to promote awareness, monitor building inspections, enforce by notice, injunction or prosecution, and they have powers under the Building Control Act to check and assess plans, documents and certificates lodged. And now, this, the Building Control Authority under Section 11 have powers of inspection, enforcement and prosecution and authorised persons are, uh, come within this. They have the right of entry, inspection at any stage, they have the right to request information, documents, taking of samples and assistance and equipment. And this will all be copper fastened by the, the new building control amendment regulations. Now, some issues for, I'm sure you all know that <coughs> the building control authorities have targets of 12 to 15 percent inspections. Um, the, the extent to which that took place in varying local authorities uh, perhaps is different. And, you know, 12 to 15 percent inspections, it's inspections of what, you know? But um, I did say I wouldn't go backwards in, in relation to uh, legacy issues, but um, we are assured by the county managers that the new system uh, will be more stream, streamlined. So some issues for consideration. A competent person is defined here as ha having regard to the task he or she is required to perform and taking account of the size and or complexity of the project possesses sufficient training, experience and knowledge appropriate to the nature of the work to be undertaken. So that's a big statement in many ways. It's not unlike the health and safety regulations, but it's saying that if you profess to be an expert in, in something and you're, you're offering the service, that you should be competent in that area. Now, some issues on competence would be the range of expertise and competence appropriate to the type of work, the need to work within the scope of your competence, the currency of the competence, and this is where CPD and uh, the, the various institutions through, through um, you know, uh, both uh, checking people coming up the stream in the, through the chartered system and then also offering ongoing um, training I, th I think is critical. It's also important that people keep up to date themselves. But one thing about the building regulations is, if you even forget the building control regulations, is it's quite organic and it keeps changing. You've no sooner got one part L, you know, through the system when a new part L comes out or they're working on part B or, or some other aspect. So it's, they're constantly evolving and uh, just coming out of college with a degree in engineering or architecture or building surveying or anything like that, it's only the starting position, it's, not, it's by no means the end. There is a need for professional judgment and I think that one can't be stressed enough. You need to be committed to the strict code of professional conduct and there needs to be sanctions. Uh, we need to avoid a tendency for expediency in determining the level of service provided. That's always been a bugbear of uh, you know, many institutes that in the current climate, people are going you know, and they're, they're, they're offering their services at an unsustainable level. Uh, the current building regulations, I would, I would suggest, you'll do it at your peril. Quite apart from the professional indemnity insurance implications, there's reputational issues as well, and uh, it is extremely important that the, the uh, various institutes and the industry and the, the employers, you know, provide a realistic level of service. Remember the new 
uh, building control amendment regulations will require uh, a fair degree of inspection, verification, validation and signing off, unlike the old system. So this is why I think I, I would emphasize that it's important to avoid a tendency for expediency and the lowest tender, and that type of thing, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't, sh shouldn't be anywhere in relation to the system. So skill care integrity, I think, is probably one of, the, one of the most significant aspects in relation to providing a competent and professional service and diligence. There is now a statutory role, and uh, in inverted commas here, I have independent role of certifiers. Um, it's very difficult when you're working for, you know, uh, maybe uh, an employer or a contractor uh, to say that I'm working independently because that person is controlling your livelihood, etc. But it, it is important and it behoves the professionals offering these services uh, to spell out, uh, you know, what's involved and the very minimum. And I would respectfully suggest uh, not take on a commission if, if you cannot get a reasonable um, agreement in relation to the scope of the work uh, and then the remuneration should follow that. Um, certs are likely to replace the old certs. So the Law Society are already um, you know, uh, watching this. And um, some years ago, I had, I had a meeting with the uh, chairman of the convincing department. It's a good many years now of the Law Society. And he was praying for registration and a system like this where there were certs of compliance so that they could park the old opinions on compliance and the opinions on compliance in the past tended to be, uh, you know, a, an opinion that it would not attract the attention of the Building Control Authority and, the, you know, and wording to the effect that it wouldn't, you know, uh, it may not comply with the regulations, it substantially complies with the regulations, etc. The current system doesn't have the same wriggle room as previously. And you will get... Uh, the institutes then changing um, their, their full service and partial service, uh, you know, um, engagement forms because it will have to be far more explicit than in the past. In recent past, there was a minimalist compliance culture in some areas. Um, now, we all know that 90% or 95% of the industry in good and bad times, you know, uh, behaved, you know, quite well, in fairness. But the percentage of errant and rogues in all professions and including the, uh, you know, the building uh, end of things um, have certainly caused reputational damage. A reliance on somebody else responsible. This now is, is closing the circle really and um, you, you, in, in relation to what needs to be done, and we'll come to that in a minute, um, it will be far more uh, uh, rigid and rigorous. The new system requires a culture change, um, and we have had a culture, maybe in relation to design and other things, to you know, drip feed the stuff onto site or leave it to the contractor or others to sort it out on site and uh, hope that, uh, that things are right, and then sign off a cert on, or an opinion on substantial compliance. The Code of Practice is not a standalone document, and it will require a lot of backfilling and underpinning and so forth with guidance and other documents from the various institutes and that is already commencing uh, within the various institutions. Um, a significant risk assessment process uh, will, when somebody is commissioned um, you know, in relation to being an assigned certifier, uh, they will have to look at the client, the contractor, the scope of service that uh, and maybe the competence of these individuals and how much hand-holding will actually be required. So I would argue here that uh, the assigned certifier will be carrying out a risk as assessment. Now the contractor and others will be obliged also uh, to check the competence of the individuals that uh, he or she employs to do the work. Um, pro forma guidance uh, and uh, code of conduct. Now, the, at one stage, it was indicated that the local authorities would 
per perhaps have an internal or their own code of uh, uh, their own code of practice uh, within this within their system. But uh, my understanding now is that uh, they are they are currently looking at the code of practice uh, with a view to issues that they might have. Um, insurance implications. Uh, now the minister did announce in, at the end of April that um, he had commissioned uh, another department, I think it was Richard Bruton's department, to look at the uh, defects liability uh, insurance and was hoping to have it in place before the, the, uh, before the, the deadline of the 1st of March 2014. I think it would be great if that actually happens and I think it might help individuals in relation to PI insurance, etc. But that requires a big, it's a big ask at the moment, it requires you know, almost mandatory insurance uh, throughout the industry, I think, to get prices down to any uh, reasonable uh, proportion. So um, I think, I did say at the start we won't be covering insurance and that's not our intention because we were asked, uh, it's not part of the, of the code of practice. But by the same token, announcements would suggest that the Minister and the Department are now taking it seriously. Um, so the next 12 months will be a transition and it will require stakeholder engagement. So protocols then, the, the local authorities' input into the Code of Practice is awaited. The, the Code of Practice has, has now been issued to the various professional institutes. I don't think it's widely available, John, is that? The case yet from the department. Well, it, it can be made available to you know to the institutes here. You know, so yeah. You, you know, to, uh, I have a copy of it or a hard copy of it. Anybody wants a copy of it? Um, the the uh, professional guidance notes and code of ethics from from professional institutes to, to support the code of practice, sanctions for inadequate control procedures and non-compliance, um, competency criteria for contractors. Uh, and certification and policing of the system. There is a, a process which is beginning now uh, and the, the uh, Construction Industry Federation have bought into it to say that they will have a registration system. Now there are training programs being developed. I was involved in the earlier building control uh, development uh, of the competency based course. John was involved with me and others in, in that and I think Something like that will at least be part of the jigsaw puzzle uh, in relation to competence on the, um, on the builder side of things. Um, insurance implications would cover that. Local authorities are working within their resources. Now I think that's a statement that uh, on the one hand is saying, yes, we will have a more streamlined system, but no, we're not going to add additional resources. And we all know in the public sector that you know, the staff are at the far end of the spectrum and hemorrhaging, I think it's fair to say. So, um, you know, unless there is significant change, I don't think there will be much by way of additional resources. My, that's my uh, view on that. It's a personal one. Uh, IT then, uh, there will be an online system and the, the uh, building control uh, processing and, uh, will be online. Um, now, there is a local authority red flag system for monitoring of a site. If an assigned certifier is, is changed in midstream, that has to be reported to the local authorities, and the local authorities have indicated that they would be looking very hard at those jobs. Now, a register of approved inspectors and certifiers uh, uh, will be compiled. You're in, in effect, you're, while uh, the code of practice um, will be or is a statutory code of practice insofar and I think John you might be saying a bit more about that in a few minutes but the the code of practice uh, we're certainly working to that as a mandatory one uh, it's not the only way that you can conform but it is prima facie evidence of compliance professional institutions then to develop best practice models for peer review the independence of the assigned assessor the assessor can be employed by a contractor provided they are a chartered engineer registered architect or registered building surveyor. Um, the department have taken the view that, uh, or the county managers I should say, that because the builder is signing off anyway, um, you know, it, it doesn't let anybody out of jail. 
Um, so registration of buildings and contractors is coming downstream. Building control administration, electronic, I've covered. Uh, insurance cover, I've already covered that. Um, and accessibility of registers. Now just quickly through the building control uh, amendment regulations. On the, in early March there, SI number 80, which is the building control amendment regulations was introduced and it will come in effect into effect from the 1st of March 2004. The transition period here uh, is to assist uh, assimilation and preparedness for implementation. Transition is it's a little bit of a limbo period where the industry and others are expected to get their acts together. Um, it'll come down, in my opinion, maybe John might have a different take on this, uh, like a curtain on the 1st of March in 2014. So you don't have the usual transitions as in the old building regulations. Now the scope of building works requiring uh, the certification is buildings and works that require a fire safety certificate. That's fairly straightforward. New, new dwellings, houses and apartments. Apartments, quite obviously, require a fire safety certificate anyway. And extensions with a floor area greater than 40 square metres. Now, there is an error, an error in the Act because it says less than 40 square metres, but I think most people realise that now. Now, a summary of the key features of the Building Control Amendment regulations are mandatory certification, lodgement of plans, mandatory inspection, uh, validation by the building control authorities. And I think it's important to emphasize here that validation does not mean approval. It's not an approval system, and validation is a process of a, uh, you know, rather than uh, anything else. So the mandatory certificates and lodgement of plans are brought in under that statutory instrument, and it gives le legal effect to the 1990 section of the regulations. It introduces the lodgement of draw drawings and um, provides for a regionalised shared service model for the local authorities. Now, um, the Building Control Authority are not under any duty under six, Section 6.4 of the Act and to do any of the following. Where a certificate of compliance or a notice is submitted, the Building Control Authority shall not be under a duty to ensure that the building or works to which the certificate or notices uh, relate will comply with the requirements of building regulations or be free from any defect. They're not required to ensure that the certificate complies with the requirement of the acts or regulations or verify that the facts stated in the certificates are true and accurate. So that's, you know, um, that's a low risk process. Uh, but given the resources and given where they're coming from, there's very much a transfer to the industry uh, to basically get their own act in place and uh, the local authorities don't have any greater liability than they had in the past. Now the Act of 2013 provides for a register of approved certifiers, risk-based local authority oversight, the electronic lodgement of notices and the pooling of the building control assessment resources. Now the owner's responsibilities are to sign the commencement notice. They must appoint a competent builder, so it's not just a, you know, they have to interrogate and satisfy themselves that the person is competent to do the work. They must appoint a competent registered professional to inspect and certify. Now that person may not be doing all the inspection, but the role of the assigned certifier in this instance uh, would be coordinating the process and there will be various people and various ancillary certifiers but it's an upfront, now John will be covering this in more detail, it's very much an upfront process that at the very start things have to be thought out unlike we make it up as, a, as we go along. They must notify the building control of any changes to these per persons and that's the red flag issue. Uh, the owner states that the certifiers are competent and the code of practice requires competition within the private sector to be conducted transparently, and I think that's an important uh, point. The assigned certifier prepares and implements the site inspection plan, and that includes an inspection notification framework. In other words, that person will agree at the start with the various parties, designers and others, uh, what they're doing, when they'll be doing it, and the, the assigned certifier 
then uh, is in a position to, to decide I will be there on a specific date. So the notification framework is part of the plan and the plan has to be prepared at, at the outset. It doesn't have to be submitted at the outset, but it has to be available to the local authorities for inspection. That person inspects and coordinates the inspection by others, follows up on non-compliance issues, keeps and maintains site uh, inspection records, and then has a duty to respond to the building control authority in relation to any information requests, uh, constructs in accordance with the plans and specifications, and the, this is the builder, I beg your pardon, must build in accordance with the plans and specifications. And there was, within the code of practice, uh, reliant on the plans and specifications, but that doesn't let the builders in any way off the hook in relation to it because they must construct in accordance with the building regulations. They must be competent, and that's important. They must cooperate then with the assigned certifier for the implementation of the site inspection plan and ensure that any design carried out by them or their subcontractors is certified and submitted. And there's a bit, there would be a big amount of design carried out by the contractors in practice. At completion stage then, uh, a certificate of compliance uh, part A completed by the builder and part B by the assigned certifier. So they're jointly certifying that it complies with the regulations. The plans, calculations, specifications and particulars for any amendments have to be picked up at that stage. They do the, 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 the uh, at the design stage, the plans, uh, you know, they may not be the full plans, but any changes or amendments or any subsequent uh, uh, design has to be included here and then they must submit the inspection plan that was implemented. The enlargement of plans at, com at completion stage uh, highlight the differences from those submitted. The plans and completion certs uh, submitted. The building control authority has three weeks to validate. Now there is a prior notice submission from between three to five weeks where the contractor, uh, if they, they can flag up a notification to the local authority, the, uh, no greater than five weeks or less than three weeks. Um, and this will be saying, I intend to be completed by a certain date. And the idea then is that at the discretion of the local authorities, they may or may not uh, decide to inspect it. Phase projects then, completion certs are submitted at each stage and then the completion cert is submitted at the, at the finish. At the completion stage, Validation by local authority. Uh, what this essentially means is that they check that the certificate is properly completed and signed by the appropriate person, that persons, that is the assigned certifier and the builder, checking that there are no unresolved requests for information, enforcement notices, or other statutory notices. And it's considered inappropriate uh, at, the, at this particular stage, uh, particularly if I go back for a second so that it makes sense here. Um, this is where there's a, a prior notification uh, that having had the three to, three to five weeks that the inspection just, the technical assessment just doesn't take place the day before uh, it's actually finished. John, you'll be covering that in more detail. Um, okay, the, the responsibility then of the Building Control Authority uh, the code of practice uh, powers to be exercised on a risk-based and random selection basis. They should include, include at least four key milestones. Now, the milestones was one that was debated, but be, because of the complexity of projects and different timings and so forth, um, it's very much a judgment call, and this is where the inspection plan by the assigned certifier has to take account of what's going on, what are the critical points, where do we need to be and what do we need to check? So in summary then, I've looked at the background and context, the regulations, stakeholder engagement, and then the building control authority, their role, and some issues for consideration. There's basically there's three things in the new regulation. So certification, um, lodgement of plans and, ins and inspection is, is what, what the three items are in it. And I'm going to go through uh, the certification and I'm going to then look at the code of practice and give you an outline of the code of practice. Uh, the code of practice, yeah, 
uh, can be made a soft copy available uh, to, to members of the institutions. So I'll, uh, I'll send it uh, to Anthony and, and it can be circulated to, to everyone. So that it, it's not publicly available, but it's been available to uh, any, any members of, of any institutions or, 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 or anybody in the, in the construction in, industry. So it's, it's not a, a hidden, hidden document. One important date that Kevin mentioned is the new system comes into effect from the 1st of March uh, of next year, 2014. So what that means is it's down to when a commencement notice is lodged. If a commencement notice is lodged before the 1st of March next year, uh, the new system does not apply uh, to that work. You know, so once the, work, uh, once the commencement notice is lodged before that date, any commencement note lodged after that date, uh, the new system applies to a lot of, of building work. So that's a, a very critical date, particularly if you're working on a project now that you're going to um, lodge a commencement notice after the 1st of March of next year, you need to be thinking about it now, you need to be advising uh, your, your clients about that. So, that, so it's, it's really a very critical, you know, most important thing maybe today is the 1st of March next year uh, to be thinking about it and think, thinking about that now. Um, I'm going to look at this certification and these are the statutory certificates that are included uh, in the Building and Trial Amendment Regulations uh, and, and they're uh, publicly available. You know, it's, it's SI 80 of, of, of 2013. Um, there, are, there are four statutory certificates uh, in the, um, the new system. Uh, the two most important ones are the design certificate at the start and the completion certificate at the end. Um, there's two other certificates in the system um, that are submitted at the start. One, there's a certificate of undertaking uh, by a person called the assigned certifier to uh, inspect uh, and to certify the work. You know, so, so there is um, uh, that undertaking given by the assigned certifier at the start. There's also a certificate of undertaking by the builder. So the builder is going to certify one, that they're competent, and two, that they're going to build in accordance with the plans and specifications uh, for, for the building, building work. Um, but the most important certificates of all uh, are the, the design certificate at the start and the completion certificate, and probably most, you know, the completion certificate, the, the most important uh, of, of all. Um, at uh, commencement stage, the there's a commencement notice lodged, and with the commencement notice, uh, the plans have to be lodged. So the first time now, you know, very critical thing is plans are going to be lodged with the commencement notice. Uh, a certificate of compliance with the design. So the design certificate is lodged uh, with the commencement notice. Uh, the owner uh, of the build, building uh, has to um, provide a notice assigning a person uh, as the assigned certifier to inspect and certify the works. There's an undertaking by that person uh, to do so. Uh, there's a notice of assignment. Again, the owner assigns uh, a builder, uh, a builder that's competent to carry out the works uh, at commencement stage, and then there's an undertaking by the builder. Now, and I'm just going to go through the cert certificates or just you know take ac e extracts from the certificates. So the first one is at... Um, commencement stage there is a design certificate uh, so the primary designer um, be it the architect or whoever is the, is the primary person uh, certifying design they sign this cert certificate uh, and they can confirm that the plan specifications um, have been prepared with uh, reasonable skill care and diligence by me and by other members of the design team uh, to demonstrate compliance with the requirements uh, of the building regulations, and the um, and and there's also part of that is I certify that having regards to the plans, the ancillary certificates, the ancillary certificates are certificates provided by other members of the design team, that the proposed uh, works are in compliance with the requirements of the building regulations. So that it's it's a quite a short. Um, so it's a one-page certificate uh, that is, is provided. Um, 
the, there's an undertaking by the assigned uh, certifier. So the, um, the person who is assigned to inspect the work and certify on completion is they give an undertaking that they're going to uh, use all, again, the terms, you know, reasonable skill, care and diligence to inspect the works, uh, to coordinate the inspection of, by others uh, and to certify you know, on completion that the work complies with the requirements of the building regulations. Um, similarly, there's an undertaking by the builder um, and the builder will confirm, one, that they are competent to undertake the works, um, two, that they undertake to construct the, the, the building um, in accordance with the plans and specifications uh, and that they're going to cooperate with uh, the inspections uh, and that are, are, are planned for, for during construction and that they you know, certify compliance on completion. Then the, the completion certificate, and probably you know, this is the most important certificate of, of all. There are two parts to this certificate. Uh, part A of the certificate is signed by the builder uh, and part B by the assigned uh, certifier. And again, just ex extracts from uh, that certif certificate is uh, firstly, you know, the, the builder is, I certify that the works uh, as completed have been uh, constructed in accordance with the plans, specifications, calculations. Uh, so one is, is certifying that it's been constructed in accordance with the, with the plans. And then the second part of it is reliant on the foregoing. Uh, I certify the works are in compliance with the requirements of the building re regulations. Uh, and then the part B of that completion certificate is uh, signed by the assigned certifier, uh, as Kevin was saying, that could be an architect, chartered engineer, uh, building, su building surveyor, that, you know, on the, on the register of building surveyors. And the the, the assigned certifier, I now certify that the inspection plan has been fulfilled by the undersigned and other indiv individuals nominated uh, therein and, and having exercised reasonable skill, care and diligence that the works uh, or building is in compliance with the requirements uh, of, this, of the building regulations. And then it also refers to uh, drawings, you know, specifications and ancillary certificates that are attached uh, to that certificate. So again, you have ancillary uh, certificates attached to the, the completion notice. So there, there are the, um, the cert certificates. Um, the at commencement stage is a requirement uh, to lodge plans uh, showing compliance with the building regulations. And uh, at completion, if there's been uh, changes in, in the plans uh, during construction, uh, there is uh, pla uh, revised plans, you know, or the, the revisions uh, uh, are are submitted. There is also in the code of practice talks about the lodgement of uh, plans during uh, construction for elements of work that, that aren't fully designed at commencement stage. The um, building uh, building control amendment regulations. Uh, a code of practice is to be published and said the, the, the draft code uh, will be made available uh, to, to you. Um, and there's probably only going to be slight amendments to the, to the code. Now the code in some ways is just a very generic code and the expectation is, is the institutions either individually or more appropriately maybe and collectively will provide further guidance in relation to um, how various things should be carried out uh, and those, th th those guidance documents uh, produced by the institutions you know, would, would be critically in, in, important. So it's a code of practice for the inspection uh, and certification of building works. The, uh, the st firstly, the status and the, the purpose of the, co of the code. Uh, it's, it's a statutory code. You know, it's a very important you know, to note that it's uh, a statutory code of, of, of um, code of practice. And it's published by the minister under uh, the building control regulations. Uh, the purpose of the, co of the code is to provide uh, guidance in respect to the inspection certifying of, of building works. 
uh, in relation to, to compliance with the requirements. Uh, and if you follow the code, it's prima facie evidence uh, of uh, compliance with, with the requirements. Uh, you can use alternative uh, frameworks or approaches uh, to, to the code if you, if, if you have an alternative approach that, that is you know, to, to a similar standard. Um, again, the three elements to the building control amended regulations is there's is certification, lodgement of plans, uh, and inspection. <coughs> and I'm just going to outline just the, the contents, contents of the code and then I'll go through some of the individual aspects. Um, there is an introduction. Uh, there is definitions, and definitions you know, uh, never, should never be <coughs> overlooked. Uh, a lot of work went into uh, some of the definitions um, in relation to the, uh, the code. Uh, one, just pick out, out one, was in terms of the definition of competence is included in the, de in the def definitions uh, in the code. Um, the roles and duties uh, of the various parties is set out, uh, and the institutions involved in preparing the code uh, were very adamant that, you know, that the responsibilities and duties of the various parties uh, were set out. So the owner, the builder, uh, the designer, the assigned certifier, and the building control authority. Uh, it, the code then goes into you know, certification uh, and just um, dealing with you know, providing certain guidance in relation to completion to, to the certification. Uh, the lodgement of plans uh, in terms of the, the type of plans that should be lodged and specifications should be lodged, the lodgement of plans during construction. This is particularly where elements of work are not designed uh, at commencement stage uh, and that they would be uh, subsequently lodged during construction. Um, the, then the code outlines the commencement stage uh, and what needs to be submitted to the Building Control Authority. Uh, it goes through the construction stage, uh, the in inspection plan, inspection <coughs> notification framework and, and records of, of site inspection. And I'm going to go th through these in more, a bit more detail. Um, the completion stage, in terms of what needs to be submitted at completion stage and validation and registration of uh, the certificates. Uh, the archiving of records, you know, how long should uh, records be retained for? Uh, it covers e-lodgements and the intention is uh, uh, that the system will be a system of uh, electronic uh, lodgements and very specifically uh, Fingal County Council uh, are, will be going out uh, shortly to procure a national system uh, to, to uh, handle the, the whole uh, the whole new system, uh, so that it, it is all elect electronic. Uh, it covers uh, professional ethics, uh, and it deals with insurance. Now there isn't uh, any mandatory uh, insurance requirement, but as Kevin was saying, that that the minister is uh, looking uh, at that in terms of of, of bringing in defect liability insurance. Um, the um, code uh, talks about uh, the, the certification and just maybe just elaborates you know, what is appropriate, particularly in relation to um, ancillary cert certification uh, and what is appropriate with, you know, with ancillary uh, certificates. So again, the uh, certificates, the, the, the design certificate at commencement, uh, the undertaking by the assigned certifier, the undertaking by the builder, and then the completion certificate and the code uh, goes through uh, each, each of those. Um, in relation to the design certificate, probably the main issue kind of it addresses is uh, you know, the relationship with the, um, the various members of the design team and ancillary certification. Uh, the completion certificate, um, it's signed by the builder and assigned by the assigned certifier. Uh, and then there will be supporting uh, certification uh, with, um, with that completion certificate by members of the design team, but also uh, maybe uh, specialists and other designers that have been engaged uh, by the builder during construction. Uh, the lodgement of plans, uh, not to be one of the most important things in terms of this system is the requirement to lodge plans uh, at commencement stage and then uh, again on completion, and possibly in some cases during, during construction. And so the one benefit of, of that is that 
uh, it'll force you know, the owner to ensure that plans are prepared uh, and proper plans are prepared before uh, work commences. So I think that's you know, a very important element of, of the system. There's been a lot of focus on the certification, uh, but the, the plans and that proper plans are prepared uh, is, is critical importance. Um, in terms of the, the code uh, covers about what are appropriate plans uh, to lodge uh, uh, at commencement stage and it outlines uh, what those plans should be. You know, firstly, general arrangement plan plans, uh, sections, uh, elevations, drawing, uh, drawing showing particular details as, as appropriate, uh, drawing showing work be below ground, uh, and general arrangement uh, structural drawings. Uh, so in relation to structural drawings specifically, you know, that's, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's outlining that it's what's appropriate are general arrangement uh, structural drawings, uh, specifications, uh, an overview of, of assessment in relation to the requirements of the building regulations part A to M, you know, which, which of the requirements apply uh, and, and that they're you know, set out so that someone that's designing the building, uh, the members of the design team have identified uh, which are the relevant requirements in the building regulations. Uh, an energy assessment, um, either deep or, or NEEP, under Part L. Uh, and then again, in relation to, on the structural side, uh, a confirmation of that the site investigation report, structural calculations, uh, etc., uh, are being kept and will be available to the building control authority uh, on request. And the code outlines you know, that, that they should be provided within, in, in two weeks uh, of being requested. So there isn't a requirement, you know, in terms of the code, doesn't say the site investigation should be submitted, uh, but that it should be available. And similarly, the structural calculations, it doesn't look for the structural calculation to be submitted, but again, that they should be available, on, be kept and, and available on, on request. Um, inspection, again, an absolutely critical area of the new system is that inspections are carried out uh, during construction. So there's a statutory requirement to have an inspection plan and, inspe and that inspections are car carried out. Um, so the, the person who is overall uh, responsible for uh, the inspection is the assigned certifier. Normally this will be the primary uh, the designer, uh, the, but it could, it could be somebody else, but normally it will be the primary uh, designer. Uh, so the uh, assigned certifier uh, carries out inspections themselves uh, and coordinates the inspections, inspection by others. You know, so if, if the architect is the assigned certifier, they're going to arrange for the structural engineer, the services engineer, you know, other members of the design team uh, to carry out uh, inspections you know, of their critical elements of work. The inspection approach, again, it's, it's very generic in, in, in the code and it's expected that the institutions will provide further guidance on exactly what should be done for different types of buildings. Uh, one, there's an inspection plan. So at the start, there's an inspection plan. Now that can and may develop over time, but there's an inspection plan uh, prepared. Um, the assigned certifier is responsible for that obviously will work with other members of the design team. Part of that is an inspection notification framework, and I, and I will talk about that in a, in a moment. And then there's records of the site inspection, so uh, the requirement to maintain records of site inspections. And I just stress the word, you know, it's inspection. It's not super, supervision, it's in, in, in inspection. And in relation to consultation um, and particularly uh, changes to the uh, cert certificates. Um, the word supervision was changed to inspection uh, because of, you know the, the uh, insurance industry said you know it they would have difficulty or they wouldn't provide PI cover if the, your, the word supervision uh, was used. Um, the inspection plan um, that the assigned certifier will look at the particular building or building works that are being carried out. And you know what what is relevant, you know, to to, uh, um, to the inspection plan and what what should make up the inspection plan, and they take in various factors, um, you know, in terms of what uh, critical factors in the building. I'll, I'll speak about that, those in a moment, um, and that 
should ensure that adequate uh, site records uh, are, are, or inspection records are kept, uh, you know, to de demonstrate, you know, that, that the site inspection plan has been uh, implemented. Uh, the inspection plan will depend on the type of building, the method of construction, uh, how serious it is if there's non-compliance, um, works that are going to be covered up and can't be inspected subsequently if they're critical elements of work, uh, they may need to be inspected, and, then, and the speed of construction. Uh, and the inspection plan, um, again, it'll de it depends on the judgment of the assigned certifier uh, and other members of the design team, are what are the critical inspections that should be carried out uh, and what periodic inspections should be ca carried out uh, and to think it, it all through. Um, part of the inspection plan is an inspection notification framework. So an inspection notifications are where the builder uh, informs the assigned certifier or other, other members of the design team, uh, the foundation, you know, the foundation cuttings are ready for inspection, the drainage is ready for inspection. So there might be certain uh, elements where uh, the builder is required to uh, notify uh, that something is ready for inspection or will be ready for inspection. Um, so the, and, the, and that's the inspection notification framework. So the assigned certifier should agree this inspection notification with the building owner and the builder uh, at the start. Um, the um, inspection notification Inspection notification framework will again will depend on the on the type of building and, uh, and you know critical aspects of the construction, um, and the inspection uh, notification uh, framework should uh, generally identify generally the stages or items of work that individual certifiers wish wish to be notified of of uh, and when they're ready for inspection. So this is you know part of the of the plan. Uh, the this system, in terms of, of the inspection plan notification framework, is similar to what's used uh, in the UK. Uh, just in conclusion, in relation to the, the code, and I just one last summary slide, but in relation to the code itself, uh, it is a statutory code of practice. You know, it's important to note that. Uh, if you comply with the code, it's primary capacity evidence of compliance. Um, it gives general guidance, uh, as, as I've outlined. Uh, and it is expected that institutions and organisations, either individually or, I say, ideally, collectively, uh, will come up uh, with guidance documents, you know, maybe a robust set of guidance documents in relation to um, different types of buildings uh, and what is appropriate. Uh, so I think if the industry could get together in relation to those, I think it would be very important. Um, and then the summary slide uh, that... The Kevin gave, you know, in terms of, of background and context, context uh, the engagement that has taken place, uh, uh, building control authorities, uh, issues for consideration, the regulations for the you know building control amendment regulation to, to 2013, uh, the certification, uh, and the code of practice. So this is a very, very just broad uh, view. Um, I say the, the most important thing of all is to realise that the. Uh, the 1st of, of March 2014, it will be very important. Um, the, the regulations, there's going to have to be some corrections made to the regulations uh, over the next number of, mo of months. Uh, there was one, just one error in relation to 40 square metres uh, extensions. So uh, if there are some critical tweakings, tweak, tweaks, not major tweaks, you know, uh, uh, they can possibly be made uh, at that stage. And then the code of practice has to be finalised uh, and formally, formally issued. So thank you very much. Uh, John Donnie from the Institution of uh, Structural Engineers. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin um, and John, for a most comprehensive overview of the pending regulations coming down the road. Um, I suppose the sig most significant change there is going from self-regulation to self-certification, but it certainly should give clarity to, to owners, uh, designers and contractors as to what is expected. Um, I, suppose, I think the slides have answered many of our questions, but I'm sure it's probably posed a number from yourselves as well. Uh, in particular, I suppose, as regards the whole insurance issue, which still has to be clarified. 
And uh, just a question that I might ask would be the code of practice versus the technical guidance documents, um, A to M, I think. Is there going to be a conflict there, or will they comply with each other? Or will they both be in existence? But she can answer that later. Um, I suppose from a consultant's point of view, it's certainly going to mean a lot more work um, in setting out the new, maybe new terms of engagement with, it, with the, our uh, developers, um, and the extra fees possibly that may be involved um, in carrying out all of this inspection work. Uh, that's one we'll have to, to watch and see. But if you have any further questions, um, please uh, feel free to ask. Yeah, just, just um, John, just answer, in terms of the technical guidance documents, um, the technical guidance documents specifically relate to the uh, building regulations, you know, technical requirements, uh, and the code of practice is specifically to do with the building the, the control regulations. So there won't be any be any conflict. conflict between them. We take it. We've a little bit of time, so uh, if there's any questions there, please uh, feel free. In the middle there. Yes, I was wondering in a uh, situation of a design and build contract where uh, the design would be maybe only just a, a performance specification at the time that a contractor is appointed. A contractor will then go on site and start um, pre preliminary elements of the work before substantial portions of the design might be completed. Where does that leave you in terms of the design certificate, which must be lodged at the Okay, in that situation, if if very little of the work has been designed uh, at, at commencement, um, that specific issue hasn't been uh, maybe thought uh, through. through. Uh, I think what would be probably appropriate is to, you know, lodge a, a design certificate for what has been uh, done, um, and then to state that um, the you know full plans, whatever, will be lodged whatever, in X number of months, uh, and then uh, a new uh, design certificate issued, issued, you know, submitted at that stage. So you lodge the commencement notice um, with uh, a design uh, certificate uh, for what has been designed, but then with a big caveat to say the, the design is, is ongoing and the full design will be carried out for the next period of time. It's not something that's specifically dealt with in the amendment. Uh, it's, it's not, it, it hasn't been dealt with. It hasn't been dealt with in the amendment, uh, and it, the, it hasn't been dealt with in, in the code. You know, so, so in terms of, of if it was to be added in anywhere, if, if it was considered a major issue, it would be something that would be added into the code to give guidance about what you do in, in that situation that you outlined, Paul. Kevin mentioned there about the technical guidance documents. That, what, what's your understanding? Well, um, at the very outset, um, we, you, <coughs> members of the Code of Practice Working Group and the Stakeholder uh, Working Group were concerned that the, um, you know, the, there was a gap, and a, a big exposure, and there was a model, I think it was the Victoria, the Australian model, was looked at, looked at by the RIAI. Um, now, the Minister did announce uh, as I said on the 30th of April, that um, he's looking for much stronger, uh, you know, insurance in relation to, um, and no quibble, I think, was the way it was put. So, uh, but it, 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 it would be project insurance, but he, he specifically uh, spoke about defects liability uh, insurance. Now, the decennial, the French system, was looked, upon, looked at as part of the uh, discussions, if you like, within the stakeholder group and within the code of practice, and uh, that required its own regime of inspection, etc. And some people felt that, you know, that one, uh, well, it works in France. Maybe we we might or mightn't be able to afford that. Um, the industry, as in the CIF, have been asked by the minister to go and uh, check the viability of this, and there has been a notional deadline. Uh, you know, at least this is what was reported in, in the in the press there, uh, that he would ideally like to see it implemented before uh, the uh, building regulation or building control amendment regulations kicked in on the first of March, and they they did say they're talking to two or three different insurers uh, in relation to that. So 
I think the, the intention is that it would be similar, that it would be a project-based insurance, that it might have a liability of, you know, or a cover of up to 10 years, uh, but that it would be primarily, uh, you know, defects liability insurance. Now, I know Home Bond, uh, and they've come in for a lot of criticism in the past, but they have also changed, you know, the, their offerings, if you like, in future to be closer to the defects liability insurance that people expected. And, uh, you know, we all know the adverse publicity that's been associated. With that. But it wouldn't incorporate a PI insurance? No, it's, it's standalone insurance, and I think it's, a first, it's seen as a first point of, you know, redress, if you like, in the event of something going wrong, and then uh, the insurers between themselves will pursue whoever they, they wish to, you know, but that the, the intention was that it would that it would be set up in such a way as not to prejudice the uh, you know the the uh, future building owner or whatever you know. Okay. Just one question for John. John on, on the on the uh, inspection plan. You know, it's a common thread through the service. Yes. And you don't have to submit it prior to construction. You submit it at, on the completion of the works. And it says in the Act that the local authority may, within 21 days, raise queries. You know, is uh, the okay. First, in terms of the um, ins inspection, uh, uh, so what's the first part of your question, Kevin? No, it's just yeah. because of the importance of you know the content. Of, of, will it be guidance? Will it be? Uh, uh, what well, the the the, the code of practice is in terms of the guidance it gives is very broad. You know, in, in relation to the uh, what, how the, the inspection sh plan should be constructed. Constructed, uh, it is very much an, an inspection and not um, supervision. Um, the view of the members of the various institutions and the, the CIF that were there that they didn't want it, the code to be uh, extremely specific because it said it varied so much between building and building. And the institutions and the CIF said that they would prefer that they could provide guidance on individual types and what might be appropriate. But I think it, it, they should be just periodic inspections uh, and in, you know inspections of, of critical critical items. You know, so, so that's the, you know that's the intention of, of having it. We did want to, and Kevin mentioned, um, to put in some indication of there should be at least one inspection a month, you know, as an absolute minimum. Uh, the but the you know the, the various members of the code committee didn't want that uh, include, included. So that's the uh, inspection of the other parts. Uh, I suppose uh, where I'm coming from is the word substantial is, is no longer with us. So your certification mentions the word your inspection plan. Yes. That you, it conforms to the inspection plan. How wide or how detailed that inspection plan? If you if you do an inspection plan. As long as you are, you know. Yeah, and in terms of somebody actually preparing an inspection plan, would want to be quite careful, you know, that that, that if you uh, set out a very detailed inspection plan uh, and then don't imp implement it, uh, you know, you, you would find yourself uh, caught by um, setting down something that you didn't uh, you didn't do. One of the reasons why I submitted at the end, uh, the, actually, the minister uh, wanted it submitted at the start, you know. Uh, in, in, in that, again, the institution and the CIF said, look, it's going to be something that's evolving uh, during construction. Uh, and that, so it's, it's confirmation at the end, this was the inspection plan. Was, but we want to be very careful with the inspection uh, inspection plan. And then whatever you say you're going to do, that you do that. Uh, and so it's, it's one way, you know, in terms of protecting yourself. You know, not to, and the second part of the question, and the last question, yes. can you submit that at the end? It says in the, in the Act that the building control may raise queries within 21 days. Okay, yes. on, the 20, on the 21 de days, and again, uh, the code uh, sets out what, um, the, what the local authority should, should do, do. You know, on that, uh, at, at this at completion stage, um, that the completion, completion uh, certificate is submitted uh, any revised plans uh, are submitted at completion stage, and the local authority uh, within 21 days, if they're going to reject reject that 
uh, complete a notice. Um, they have to do it within 21 days, or if they want to request uh, any further information, it has to be done uh, within 21 days. What's, what it says in the Code of Practice is the if a local authority hasn't raised any queries during you know, construction, so if, if there isn't an information request out that's outstanding, there isn't a, an enforcement notice that hasn't been complied with, uh, that provided the completion certificate is signed by the correct uh, people that the local authority should, should accept it. There is provision then for the lodgement, uh, a pre-notification procedure um, uh, ahead of, of the actual finding, final completion notice being submitted so that the day after it's, it's submitted that it, it, it can be ex accepted. This is you know, to get over this issue, issue of uh, if you're doing a building handover. Yeah. You can't wait 21 days. Right. But the code, the, well, the advice in the code is that the local authority, unless they have a query that's uh, unresolved, they haven't got a right to be, it's not a time to be raising issues uh, at that stage. Okay. Just, <clears throat> just an observation first, we're a great country for legislating and a lousy country for enforcing. This seems to be a little bit more of it. But, um, one specific thing is that it, is, it, what, what, is there anything to stop there being a new breed of animal called assigned certifiers? Like when fire certs were brought in, they were farmed out by the architects to other parties, which is part of the problem, that's why we're in the mess we're in. Um, does, does the assigned certifier have to be a lead consultant on the, on the team? No, they don't. No, no, that's, so, that's so, a disaster. So, so you could have, you know, the same. So we have a new breed of assigned certifiers who won't be involved in designing the building. Uh, you, you, you could. Uh, and if you look at, in, in the English situation, they, they have uh, a person called an approved inspector, uh, and the approved inspector, the approved inspectors are, are even uh, cons consulting firms, per uh, and they might not be involved in, in the design whatsoever. That's a disaster waiting to happen again. Anyway. Okay, so there's a question here. Um, Sorry, Jeff, you mentioned that you can list out your ancillary certifiers and what, uh, cert what, what or your ancillary checkers and what inspectors and what they may yes. inspect. Is that's envisaged there to allow you to give a comprehensive plan to show where the where the responsibility for inspection is yes. within the cross of the line? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, uh, if you're an architect, you're not going to uh, carry out structural inspections. Uh, like you to carry out structural inspections or uh, inspections of, of, of elements that you haven't got any uh, detailed knowledge of or experience in. And I noticed uh, one of the common themes through both what yourself and Kevin have been saying is that you keep going back to items of major importance. And I suppose from, from the perspective of the department, would it be fair to say that the department feels that that what they're trying, what they're trying to do here, is to get a system in place that will stop major um, non-compliance, as opposed to something where they're going to go out and trying to be penalising consultants and builders for the money, minutia. Of well, yeah, well, I mean, the, the focus should be on getting, um, you know, dealing with the major issues and, and getting a, a, a compliance. You know, culture. You know that, that buildings are being designed right and, and being built right. You know, and it's, uh, trying to create that culture. Sorry, Anthony. Just to say that the assigned certifier. You know, there's a whole range of. of uh, you know, you have the electrical. You know, maybe heating, plumbing, etc. So, uh, if you really look at the potential number of assigned certifiers, it could quite. Uh, you know, the, the the ancillary certifiers list. Uh, can, can be uh, quite exhausting, or exhaustive, I should say, rather than exhausting. It might be exhausting too for the for the certifiers who actually pull it together. But um, there is provision, and I think it's not so much that it spreads risk; it actually shows diligence in relation to, you know, the assigned certifier demonstrating that they have a very comprehensive approach to it. Okay. Who do you think? Uh, in your own opinion, the owner of all the uh, 
the, 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 the ownership of all of them. Who is that person? Yeah, the, the, the owner. <laughs> not a, that's the, always an easy an answer. Okay, it's the the building owner, uh, the, the client, the, the, whoever uh, is directing. You know, the overall in terms of what is being built. You know, the person who, ha who has the overall right uh, and is going to pay the bills in terms of what is. Uh, if there's been a building being built or work being carried out, whoever that. Uh, uh, person is, is you know is considered the, the the building owner. And he uh, takes on full responsibility of all the certificates that come in from the assigned certifiers. Is that right? Um, no. If something goes wrong in the building, if something happens or whatever. If, if something goes wrong, uh, you know there there's um, in terms of if something goes wrong, there's there's liability. Mm -hmm. You know the the question of you know who might be. Uh, taking, you know, concern. Uh, the building control authority w would be one group that could take action. Um, some aggrieved uh, purchaser of, of a house or something could could attempt, you know, to, to take uh, ac action or you know, various people could. could. The um, the owner, the, um, the person having it built in the first case, okay, they have responsibilities, uh, an overall responsibility to make sure buildings are designed right and built built right. Uh, Specifically, then on the system, they're, they're asked to in, ensure that the builder uh, is, you know, that they're appointing is competent to, to build the work, that the person certifying the work, the design certifier is competent uh, to inspect and certify the work. Now, if someone certifies uh, work uh, and it's clearly shown that uh, they certified incorrectly, uh, you know, the liability at the end of the day. Uh, could fall on them, uh, but the builder, so the owner, uh, you know, you know, is ultimately could be ultimately responsible, um, except that somebody else is shown to be liable. Mm -hmm. But I, do, I just think that the, 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 the owner, the person who buys, like, like a politician, the person who buys them, is uh, the person that's going to be giving them the advice on all these other services. You know, I just think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting field. Yeah. It should be interesting at all. It starts kicking off. Um, just in relation to the. Um, the, 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 again, the site inspections is something which I think is, is very important here from a facility engineering perspective in that, you know, in, up under the SE9101, we're then on a normal services, is every two weeks you go to site or at the request of contractor uh, to inspect. And uh, now if we're talking about words like adequate site inspections, we're looking at, you know, full service, partial service. So, you know, if, if I'm putting together um, uh, an inspection plan for a development and I, and the word I is used everywhere in the assigned search for what I mean by I is on behalf of my company. Yes. Um, is uh, I would put that together. Um, will the local authority have any comments on that site inspection plan? In other words, will they approve it or have any comments on it? Or does it rest with me to get that right? Uh, it rests rest with, with you to get that, that right. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Surprisingly, in some ways, is the inspection plan is actually submitted at completion, you know, not not a com at, not a comment at commencement, um, and it's the inspection plan that that, that was carried out. Now, the, the local authority, uh, the building control authority, could ask you during construction, "Well, show me uh, your site inspection plan," uh, but the responsibility uh, rests with you in terms of uh, deciding what's appropriate. Okay. Sorry, Kevin just referred to the need to avoid the tendency for expediency and sort of race to the bottom of this. You know, make a product and it's um, does that mean that in terms of design teams picking uh, contractors, that they won't be tied, you know, by the sort of GCC and um, the cheapest price that they'll have more discretion with regard to competency, which seems to me more important? Yeah. I, I think because of the onerous nature of it, that um, the lowest tender or you know, even public contracts, uh, which which talk about the most advantageous tender, etc. Uh, you know, in the past, it tended to be still biased for, towards the cost factor. I think the cost goes out the window in relation to this. But to what extent, you know, um, are you going to be able to interrogate the contractor at, at the very outset to find out, you know, um, how much, you know? And they know or are but I think track record is going to be an important one uh, in relation to this and certainly the lowest standard 
would be um, very undesirable. Um, I think PI insurance will be on the line uh, in this, and it, 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 it does, I know John has said, and he's, he's quite right, the inspection plan uh, is not an upfront issue, and the local authorities have also taken what I, you know, is, is effectively a risk averse uh, approach, but they have, one of the things the minister did say in, in his, um, you know, his, his speech there, or his, his, the article to the newspaper, was that um, be, because it's a risk-based system, that they should look at maybe contractors, but others who have, you know, that there have been enforcement proceedings or that in the past against them, uh, or uh, defects or whatever. Um, but but certainly, I think uh, the, the I, I mentioned the devil is in the detail, and I, and I think it is, and I think it will work itself through the system that. Um, the lowest tender would be a very, very, um, you know, dangerous, uh, you know, system to, to, to go there. But I, I also think that individuals at the moment might be tempted to, uh, you know, for competitive reasons or for business reasons, put in, you know, um, unreal and, and very low tenders. And I think that's up to the industry. It's up to the uh, contractor. It's up to the owner. And I think you, you probably will see more of competency questionnaires coming into the system. Now, it's horses for courses in relation to the projects. Some projects for extensions of 40 square meters may be relatively straightforward, but when you get into the bigger complex projects, I think they're, they're the due diligence, due, due diligence process, because there's been a big risk shift you know, back to the employer, the assigned certifiers and others to actually ensure that, that it's done. Um, in the event that the local authority do look for the inspection plan at the outset, and they would be expected to if, if you know, and they ran them 12 to 15 percent inspections or whatever, they would be expected to be selective in relation to, to that, to what they look for. But I think it's probably not the worst thing in the world that the inspection plan goes in at the end because as John has said, so many things can happen during the project, you know, in, in relation to uh, what needs to be done there. Okay, I'll take one final question. Sorry, two questions. Uh, one, one question. <laughs> maintain the register of approved inspectors and certifiers. Is each local authority going to do it the same way as the site suitability yeah, no, it, assessment? Yeah. In terms of no, in terms of the op, there, there is no um, so initially there's no in terms of upholding a register um, that isn't, isn't 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 the case. So initially, in terms of the registers uh, of uh, in terms of the of the of the three, yeah, the, 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 the assigned certifier I can understand, but there, there is mention of the um, certainly Kevin mentioned yes. a register of approved uh, inspectors and pet certifiers. It, it is envisaged that they're they're moving towards that and a register of contractors as well. Now yeah. I think uh, the the CIF would be involved in uh, you know uh, setting up the system uh, over a period of time. It it won't happen overnight, uh, you know, in relation to that. But it is envisaged that there will be a register. Um, the site suitability is not, as you probably know. Uh, it's not a building regulations issue, it's a planning issue, but uh, that's a register of, of competent people. Uh, but not all local authorities were, you know, had a register. Some kept a register, others didn't. Some precluded, uh, you know, people only on that, uh, you know, they, 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 they had an assessment system, uh, quite apart from the, the competence of their certification. And the, the, the other question on that is really on the, the final certificate, uh, the Part B, uh, which is to be signed by the, the uh, assigned certifier. Yes. He is certified, regardless of any certification by others, by the builder or by the other designers, he's certifying compliance with the building regulations. That, no, he's going to get insurance for Again, it, it depends on you know how you interpret you know the the, the, the 
um, the certificate, you might you know pull the, the wording and say that's uh, a definitive. You know, I, cer I, I certify. Uh, in terms of the, the legal view, it, you know, our one legal view is you know the whole cert uh, is taken into account together. Um, there's, there's, there is two parts of it. It also refers to uh, a code of practice, uh, and that you know what somebody should you know reasonably do. It refers to you know ancillary certificates. So um, you, you can't necessarily uh, take the uh, those wording uh, out. Uh, specifically, some of the institutions are you know are seeking legal advice on that point that you're making in terms of absolutely you know uh, and the. And if it's seen that in terms of legal opinion, you know, it was given to the department, you know, the, 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 it needs a, a slight amendment to make sure that it is the whole lot that that can be. There was there was a uh, a different wording there which was reliant on the foregoing, yes. but but that wording was taken out uh, when the it, it, the act was the, the regulations were published. Yeah. And perhaps you know that you know it should go back in. Again. Reliant, sorry, reliant on the foregoing is in the builder's certificate. Yes, but it's not in the assigned certificate. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it certainly it's food for thought there, and it certainly should lead to a, a strengthening of our building control, building control system and hopefully prevent a reoccurrence of uh, some of the issues we've had with poorly constructed buildings over the last few years, particularly with the power light and, 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 and fire regulations. I'd just like to thank John and Kevin again on behalf of the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Institution of Structural Engineers. <coughs> thank you both very much for a very comprehensive presentation. Um, if you could just show your appreciation in the usual way.